14,000 years ago, Africa began to change. The cyclical fluctuations in the Earth's orbit triggered a seasonal monsoon off its western edge, supplying huge amounts of moisture from the Atlantic Ocean into the continent's interior, transforming the desert landscape into a vast expanse of grasslands, a green Sahara. Where there are now rolling sand dunes, gentle grassy hills once sat. The wadis and ergs became river systems and lush plains. The land's many basins partially filled, dotting the region with lakes, all together ushering in the African humid period. Rock carvings from throughout the area document the presence of animals like giraffes, elephants, rhinos, and really all the creatures of the African savanna, including the makers of these artworks, humans. If you'll remember, a while back, it must have been in 2019, wow, three years ago. Three years ago, I made a video explaining the science behind this period. But lately, I've started to think about it again. I think the reason why is because I just finished listening to the newest episode of my current favorite podcast, Fall of Civilizations, that examines, believe it or not, the course taken by civilizations, often from their humble beginnings through their times of growth and even prosperity, all the way to their inevitable fall, eventually becoming lost to history. And if I've learned anything from listening to all 15 episodes or over 30 hours, it's that more often than not, environmental change plays a huge role in the stability of societies. Whether it was the Nabataeans finding their lands increasingly desertified, the people of Rapa Nui being forced to live with the consequences of their own presence, the fluctuations in global temperature that drove the Vikings out of Greenland, or even the volcanic eruptions thought to have brought about the Bronze Age collapse. And this all is what got me thinking about the Green Sahara again. Here's a place we know was not only habitable, but inhabited for a span of over 9,000 years, only to witness the worst environmental calamity of all, having their source of water run dry. Ever since we came to this understanding, people have wondered what role this region might have played in our ancient history. Unfortunately, the desolate nature of the modern day Sahara makes questions like these exceedingly difficult to answer, and as a result, we know next to nothing about the people who once lived here. Another, perhaps more optimistic way of putting this is to say that the sands of the Sahara may very well remain ripe with potential for discovery, so long as you know the proper places to look. And in fact, a series of recent discoveries have revealed just how much there might be left to find. Back around the start of the 1800s, France, led by Napoleon, invaded Egypt for some reason, and long story short, started excavating a whole bunch of ancient ruins here. It turned out the closer they looked, the more they were able to find. Tombs, temples, monuments, entire cities were all being miraculously unearthed. Even the Great Pyramids and Sphinx had to be dug out after only a few thousand years of neglect. As more and more relics were uncovered, the picture these ruins were painting was that of a magnificent civilization, one that rivaled Rome in scale and far surpassed even Greece in terms of age. In a sense, this makes Egypt the first ancient civilization to have been found and studied as such. Shortly after this, however, similar discoveries started to be made elsewhere around the world. It appeared that as fast as the sands of Egypt could bury pyramids, the jungles of Cambodia could conceal the temples of Angkor, the sea could swallow entire Roman cities, and knowledge of hidden wonders across the New World easily became lost through conquest. The fact that basically every ancient civilization had to be rediscovered at some point opens up an exciting possibility that there could still be more civilizations left to uncover, whose ruins remain undisturbed in some corner of the world visited more in the past than it is currently. 
While by now it might seem as though we've found all there is to find, as recently as 2011, 17 new pyramids, over 1,000 tombs, and more than 3,000 ancient settlements were uncovered beneath the sands of Egypt using infrared satellites. And if there are still entire cities left to uncover here, in what's probably the most studied place on Earth, one can only imagine what kinds of lost relics the rest of the Sahara could be hiding. Of course, I know what you're thinking. Just because there are monuments in Egypt doesn't mean there are anywhere else. The same way that just because the Sahara was once green doesn't necessarily mean it hosted anything more than hunter-gatherer tribes. So why am I bringing this up? Well, let's do some real quick math. 14,000 years ago, as this African humid period was just beginning, humans had already migrated far beyond East Africa, well into Europe and Asia, and had even reached the furthest extents of the Americas and Australia. That is to say, by the time the Sahara greened, humans would have been more than capable of immediately finding and inhabiting it. However, around the same time Northern Africa was being transformed, another equally important change was happening nearby. 12,000 years ago, the first grains were being domesticated and grown in the Fertile Crescent. Here, the very first agricultural societies arose, the first cities filled with people, the first monuments were constructed, and the lands between two rivers became cradle to mankind's earliest civilizations. By 10,000 years ago, when the Sahara is thought to have been approaching its greenest, knowledge of agriculture arrived to the African continent through the Nile River Valley, which soon grew into its own hub of human activity. By 6,000 years ago, sorghum was being domesticated in Ethiopia, and a thousand years after that, Western Africa produced pearl millet, another cereal grain. Like this, we can see that knowledge of agriculture was spreading throughout the continent around the same time parts of the Sahara were capable of supporting agriculture, which leads me to wonder did any other agrarian societies arise beyond these few hubs? And if so, where? Like I said at the start of this video, while the potential for discovery certainly exists here, as long as our search area covers the entirety of the Sahara, we're likely not going to find anything. So what we need to do now is narrow down our search parameters and come up with only the most likely places for agriculture to have become established. Before we do this though, I think it would help to really understand what we're looking for. You see, by now, any evidence of small-scale subsistence farming would be all but unrecoverable from beneath the desert sands. In fact, the only structures we really have any chances of finding would be large stone monuments like pyramids or temples, as those are just about the only human relics that aren't utterly destroyed after thousands of years. The only problem is that monuments like this really only get built after substantial population centers arise. In Egypt, for example, while agriculture might have arrived some 10,000 years ago, the first known pyramid was only constructed less than 5,000 years ago. What I'm taking this to mean is that if there were agricultural societies here, the only way to find them would be to look for relics of their population centers, like cities. Now, I know what you're thinking. Finding a pile of rocks among the biggest pile of rock on Earth sounds like an impossible task, but luckily this is where our old friend geography comes into play. You see, more often than not, the places people choose to settle follow very regular, very simple rules. Looking at cradles like Egypt, Mesopotamia, the Indus Valley, and China, we can see each of them sprung up around a water source, whether it was the Nile, the Tigris and Euphrates, the Indus River, or the Yellow River. The people who settled here were cultivators, and their early communities had to struggle for survival. The courses of the Tigris and Euphrates were not always certain, and it took a remarkable collective effort to build canals and flood banks for agriculture. 
From the success of these early communities grew such cities as Ur and Babylon thousands of years ago. If we want to find lost civilizations, it would appear our best bet would be first finding the lost rivers. Easy, right? Just take an elevation map of the region, calculate the paths along the lowest points, and boom, you have all the potential river systems. The difficult part, however, comes from discerning which of these were substantial and reliable enough to support agriculture. If we take a look at some of the best maps of the Green Sahara available on the internet, you might notice a pattern, or really the lack of a pattern. Lakes vary from map to map. Different rivers are emphasized. Some feature forests where others have deserts. And what this all reveals is that there's no real consensus on what exactly the region looked like during this time. Without a more scientific way of narrowing down these rivers, we'd be left with millions of square miles to explore, aka way too much for any one person, team, university, or even government to accomplish. And because of this, very few have even tried. But then in 2003, a remarkable discovery was made. As researchers from the University of Bremen started imaging the sea floor off the African coast in search of oil, they noted a feature never before described near Cape Demiris, part of modern day Mauritania. Here, the data revealed a 400 kilometer long channel running through the continental shelf, receiving the creative name Cape Demiris Canyon. Why this is so significant is because, as we learned in a previous video, underwater canyons are often carved out by the very same forces that create canyons on land, moving water. This happens as the heavier, sediment-laden river water quickly drops to the ocean bottom, where it flows much in the same way as it did on land, causing similar erosion features to form all along the sea floor. And so what this submarine canyon appears to suggest is that a large outflow of water, likely a river, once came from this point, something that clearly doesn't exist here today. Naturally, this only prompted scientists to investigate further, though it wasn't until 2015 that radar images taken by a Japanese Earth observation satellite revealed a network of paleo riverbeds buried beneath the sands here. While most of these drained only small and local basins, one of them, Taman Rasset River, was found to extend far deeper into the interior. Following this riverbed upstream, the scale of it grows as tributaries break away, until a drainage basin of approximately 1 million square kilometers takes form, or roughly the same area as the Ganges River drains in India. Assuming a similar volume of water flowed through this basin as the Ganges, that would have for a time made the Taman Rasa the second greatest river in all of Africa by discharge, falling behind only the mighty Congo. And geographically speaking, this makes sense. Think about it, if the Green Sahara was sustained by a monsoon originating in the Atlantic Ocean, then it would have made landfall on Africa's western coast, soaking this part of the continent more reliably than anywhere else within the whole region. In fact, this position directly in the path of the monsoon means that this was also probably the first part of the region to start receiving rains some 14,000 years ago, as well as the final place to see any rain at all once the monsoon started to diminish. If we find the Taman Rasset River on Google Earth, we can still see parts of it rather clearly. In fact, if I zoom in real close, we'll notice the riverbed is now lined with trees and shrubs, setting it apart from its otherwise barren surroundings. What these plants reveal is that there is still some degree of water flowing through this valley today, just not enough to rise above the surface. Overall, thanks to its geography, the Taman Rasset Basin would have been the longest lasting vestige of a green Sahara, which at least in my opinion makes it the best bet for having been able to sustain a stable agricultural society. Whether or not it actually did, however, remains unknown. 
Now, at first, this might seem ridiculous. How could we just not know? Surely there must be loads of eager archaeologists just lining up for their chance to discover a whole new civilization. So why haven't they? Well, as is the case with anything, it's complicated. First off, having only been discovered in 2015, the argument could be made that there just hasn't been enough time to properly research, gather a team, and receive funding for an expedition to this remote corner of the world. On top of that, this riverbed lies in one of the most inhospitable and inaccessible areas on Earth, making it exceedingly difficult to conduct months, years, or even decades-long surveys and excavations required here. But perhaps the biggest reason investigations have stalled again has to do with our old friend geography, specifically political geography. You see, while the Taman Rasat River reaches the ocean in Mauritania, its river valley quickly meanders northward across international borders into the country of, uh... Well, on most maps, this area is known as Western Sahara and is included as part of Morocco, but almost always with a little caveat like this, reading, Western Sahara, formerly Spanish Sahara, was divided by Morocco and Mauritania in 1976. Morocco has administered the territory since Mauritania's withdrawal in August 1979. The United Nations does not recognize this annexation, and Western Sahara remains in dispute. To add on to the complications, the instability of this situation has consequently seen the rise of a nationalist rebellion led by what's called the Polisario Front, which, depending on who you ask, are either a group of terrorists or the rightful representatives of the Sahrawi people caught in the struggle for self-determination. While tensions between the Moroccan government and the Polisario Front seem to have been cooling down ever since the 1991 ceasefire agreement, in 2020 tensions escalated rapidly after a border dispute, leading to a series of armed conflicts which have now been deemed by some as the Second Western Sahara War. An updated map of the territory looks like this, where the larger portion with all the big cities and coastline remains administered by Morocco, while the desert interior lies in the control of the Polisario, an area that just so happens to be where this ancient riverbed runs through. No matter what side of the conflict you fall on, the fact that a large portion of our area of interest falls in and around an active war zone makes it virtually impossible for anyone, let alone a team of researchers, to come and look around. But okay, how about just for the sake of this video, we put on our optimist hats once again and just say that tomorrow the fighting will die back down and the scientific community gains full access to this area. But we need to take as targeted of an approach as possible. Where exactly should we search? If you're like me, your first instinct might be to say right here, where the river meets the coast. But I think this is a little misled for two reasons. First, I don't think this point here is actually where the ancient Taman Rasset emptied into the sea. My thinking is that each year as the river flooded, it would have carried with it a huge sediment load, enough to build up over time a coastal floodplain and maybe even a full delta. But of course, as the monsoons waned and the river ceased to flow, sediment was no longer being deposited here. After this, the only forces acting on the land were erosion and rising sea levels, allowing the ocean to reclaim this area over the last few thousand years, flooding the Bay of Arguin and leaving Cape Blanc and Cape Tamiris on either side. We can even see the land that once stood here from space as this bright blue formation, indicating just how shallow this area still is. If this was in fact dry land thousands of years ago, any settlements made along the ancient coastline would be several meters underwater today, only further complicating the process of discovery, study, excavation, and so on. But don't worry, I have a feeling that's not where we'd want to look anyway. 
You see, if we check back to the other ancient civilizations, Egypt's greatest cities both sat far from the coast. Memphis in modern day Cairo sits right here where the Nile River ends and the Nile Delta begins. Thebes on the other hand sits closer to the well established border between Upper and Lower Egypt. Both pretty strategic positions if you ask me. The same is true for those of Mesopotamia. Ruling the earliest cities like Ur and Uruk meant you controlled both sides of the Tigris River like Sumeria. From here, larger cities like Akkad, Babylon, and eventually even Baghdad expanded this control to both the Tigris and Euphrates. The biggest known cities along the Indus, Harappa and Mohenjo-Daro also sat away from the coast. Overall, it would appear that for the very first civilizations, the advantages of a coastline were nowhere near as important as a strategic position along their life-giving rivers. So now if you look back to this reconstruction of the river, we need to ask if not on the coast, then where might the most strategic place to put a city be? The easy thing to say is where the river meets the floodplain, or perhaps where it meets a choke point coming out of the mountains. I might as well add all the confluence points where one river meets another. It's also thought that there existed a series of paleo lakes throughout this basin, the biggest of which was Lake Ahmed in modern day Algeria. And we might as well include each of these as additional areas of interest if for nothing else but the water security they could have provided as the rest of the basin dried up. Though I want to make it really clear that I don't know if there's anything to find in any of these places and as of now it makes more sense to remain skeptical. Trust me, I've spent hours upon hours looking at Google Earth trying to spot anything unusual and came up empty handed. There's a really good chance absolutely nothing at all is here, but until there's some kind of concerted effort to go and make sure of that, we just don't know. Ultimately, what we end up with by the end of this experiment is not a series of X's on a map, but rather question marks. While to some that might seem like a lame way to conclude a video, to me that's actually the most exciting way to end. The lesson to take from this is that there are still unexplored areas, uncertain places from uncertain times with uncertain conditions with an uncertain future ahead. Altogether, leaving the Taman Raset and the role it played in our history a mystery for the time being, truly Africa's lost river. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. If you'd like to see more videos where I look at lost geographical features, let me know by giving this one a like and tell me in the comments where I should look next. If you want to know more about lost civilizations, make sure to check out the Fall of Civilizations podcast, which I didn't realize until I made this video also publishes them on YouTube as full videos. Of course, as always, I couldn't do this without my patrons. So if you want to help support me and the channel, there's a link on screen and in the description. Thanks.